Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, today is September 17th. It is the 159th anniversary of the single bloodiest day in the history of the United States military. Uh, and that is the Battle of Antietam, which was fought on September 17th, 1862 at Sharpsburg, Maryland. Uh, it's known as the Battle of Sharpsburg uh, in the South. Uh, but we're going to take a look at our friends at the American Battlefield Trust. You hear me talk about them all the time and their fantastic mission, which is to preserve and protect uh, American battlefields uh, here in the United States from the American Revolution, War of 1812, Civil War, etc. Uh, and so they're actually doing a lot of content this weekend uh, from Antietam. So I highly recommend you check those out. Uh, subscribe to their channel if you haven't already. I'll put a link in the description uh, to this original video so you can check it out and everything else on their channel. I'll also put a link in the description to my visit to the Antietam battlefield a few years ago. Now, keep in mind when you watch that, it was a while ago. And it was actually even before I had this channel, I made that video. And uh, so... Compared to my newer stuff, it's not the best quality. Uh, a lot of bouncing around, and uh, I've come a long way since then, I like to think. So uh, just be patient with me. Uh, it was much more amateur compared to what I'm trying to do now. I've still got a long way to go, but I think it's getting better. So, But at least you get a little sense of uh, some of the sights of the battlefield. So let's dive into their animated battle map of Antietam and talk about it. Following a string of summer victories, most recently at Second Manassas, in early September 1862, Confederate General Robert E. Lee seeks to maintain his hard-earned initiative. So let's talk about what's been going on here. Um, you know, so Lee takes over command of what becomes known as the Army of Northern Virginia uh, in the uh, middle of 1862 when Joseph Johnston is wounded uh, during the Battle of Seven Pines. So Lee takes over. Lee had been in command of all Virginia troops. He'd basically been kind of an advisor to Jefferson Davis. And so they, um, they put him in command of the army while Johnston's recovering. He goes on to lose almost every battle uh, of the Peninsular Campaign, but wins a strategic victory. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, winning a battle doesn't mean anything if it doesn't change the outcome of the campaign. And McClellan's army won most of those battles of the, uh, the seven days. But Lee wins a victory because McClellan retreats back down the peninsula. While McClellan's retreating back down the peninsula, John Pope is brought from the west and given command of a new army called the Army of Virginia, which goes out toward Richmond and gets spanked by Lee as he moves north up to the second battle of Bull Run. So you've got the seven days right there in, um, in May and June 1862 into July. Uh, and then in August, he comes up and wins second bull run. He, he, we, we forget how close together these big, bloody battles are. It's like one right after the other, right after the other. Uh, so you have the seven days. You have second bull run, or Manassas, in August, uh, late August, 1862. And just less than three weeks later, you have the Battle of Antietam. And now Lee's going to face McClellan again. Uh, he, but he divides his army, and that almost spells disaster because he's only got about 40,000 men as it is. It is the first time Lee's Confederates have set foot on Union soil. Lee's march into Maryland is a bold gamble. He hopes to bring the Union army to battle and deliver another crushing defeat on the U.S. Capitol's doorstep. But Lee's fortunes take a turn. He must divide his army to deal with the strong Union force at Harper's Ferry. To make matters worse, his opponent, General George B. McClellan, moves with unusual speed in pursuit. Uh, unusual speed in pursuit is right. McClellan's not known for his unusual speed. McClellan does some decent things during the Antietam campaign. Now, the battle itself is another story. McClellan has been known for his 
having a permanent case of the slows, as he was described. Uh, but he does go after Lee fairly quickly here. Uh, and if it hadn't been for a couple of really strong delaying actions by pieces of Lee's army, it could have spelled trouble. Uh, and Harper's Ferry, if you've ever been there, is a really unique and interesting um, kind of dynamic where it is, where these rivers come together and it's real high mountains that kind of come down into Harper's Ferry. It's not really a very easy place to fight a battle. His confidence boosted with an intercepted copy of Lee's operational plan. McClellan pushes Lee's thin ranks in the gaps of South Mountain. All right, so I'm trying not to pause too much, but this is really important. Special Order 191 uh, is the name of this plan. It was uh, it was basically Lee's operational plan for this campaign, and it describes step by step what each part of Lee's army is going to do. It talks about D.H. Hill staying back as the rear guard. It talks about where McClaws is going to go, and it talks about what Longstreet's going to do, what Jackson's going to do, and it talks about things like what you're supposed to do when you get to certain towns. Like It talks about what to do when they get into Frederick, and, um, and it's wrapped around three cigars, and it's found by a corporal from the 27th Indiana who brings it to his captain, who brings it to his colonel, who brings it to the corps commander, and it makes its way all the way up to McClellan. Now, some people have asked the question in the past, have asked me this question, well, how did how did McClellan know that it wasn't just a ruse to try and fool somebody or that it was even genuine? Well, it was actually Alpheus Williams, who was a corps commander uh, in the Army of the Potomac, who um, I think somebody on his staff, or maybe it was him himself, recognized the signature of the adjutant who had written out the orders because he had served with that guy in the pre-war army. And so they knew it was genuine. Uh, because they knew the guy's handwriting. Though the Southerners fall back, the fight here buys Lee time to find a battleground of his choosing. And so those those battles like South Mountain are super important, and, and people don't talk a lot about those, but uh, those are really, really important battles where small numbers of Confederates hold on for hours and hours and hours and give Lee time to concentrate his army. It's those little things like that on which major events end up turning. And, and McClellan had actually said when he got those orders, he said, here's something... Uh, with which, if I cannot whip Bobby Lee, I will be willing to go home. And of course, it did end up being McClellan's last battle in command of the army. Robert E. Lee selects a strong defensive position amidst the tidy rolling German farm fields, bordering a swiftly flowing creek, the Antietam. But Lee is bluffing. His line on September 15th is a mirage, designed to buy time to gather his forces. Keep in mind what he says there, September 15th. Battle of Antietam is fought on the 17th. What's McClellan do? He does a McClellan thing. He waits. He waits at a time when he knows, he knows because he's got Lee's orders, that Lee's forces are divided. And even when he's got everybody together, he's only got 40,000 men. McClellan, when he gets his whole force there, he's got some something over 80,000 men. He's got him two to one. He's got him better than two to one on the 15th. And he sits there and he does nothing. But even when Lee concentrates his forces, he's still got him two to one. But McClellan always thinks he's outnumbered. Stonewall Jackson has taken Harper's Ferry and is marching to join him. McClellan pauses for two days in order to better understand Lee's position. He is convinced that Lee heavily outnumbers him. Always. Yet Lee's bluff comes with heavy risk. If he is forced to retreat, there's only one escape route across the Potomac. So McClellan's got 65,000 on the 16th. The day before that, on the 15th, Lee's got far less than 40,000, maybe 25, 30,000. And the day after this, on the 17th, McClellan's going to end up with closer to 80,000 men. Back to Virginia. On the afternoon of September 16th, McClellan decides to attack. He'll first hit Lee's left, then his right, before finishing things in the center. After forwarding troops across Antietam Creek, McClellan's first attack begins early Wednesday morning, September 17th, as the soldiers of Joe Hooker's 1st Corps march south 
aiming for the Dunker Church. But now, what do you notice right away when you look at this? If I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, boy, I'm glad to be Jackson in this situation. I've got a defensive position that stretches. And if you've ever been to the battlefield, this is all very heavily wooded over here. Uh, the Dunker Church is right here. The visitor center today is, I think, right over here in this area uh, on the northern end of the battlefield. And the battlefield looks much like it did in 1862. Sharpsburg hasn't changed a whole lot. It's not like a place like Gettysburg where it's very commercialized now and there's all these museums and all this stuff. There's monuments, but really the battlefield hasn't changed that much and it's very hilly terrain. Uh, but you can see how far out Jackson's line extends and Doubleday's marching right into that. Uh, you can see Meade is one of the division commanders in the 1st Corps. He will later become the Corps commander of the 5th Corps before advancing to become the uh, Army commander. But Confederates occupy the high ground around it and unleash destructive artillery fire on Hooker's men to their front and right while Stonewall Jackson's infantry engages them near Miller's Cornfield. Hooker responds with his own guns. Some call it artillery hell. The battle here quickly escalates into some of the most savage fighting of the Civil War. Yeah, something like 8,000 casualties just in the cornfield. I mean, think about that. I mean, just the cornfield battle would have been the bloodiest battle in American history before the Civil War. Uh, there were more casualties in the cornfield than there were on any battlefield anywhere before that and in fact more casualties than i think in some wars up to that point uh just that little area right there was just absolutely brutal especially the artillery fire which was really close at times to the west john gibbon's iron brigade fares better marching through and around the cornfield they enter the west woods where they withstand vicious confederate counterattacks. by 7 a.m hooker is making progress in the cornfield and Jackson's line, Lee's left flank, is under a very real threat of collapse. But just then, momentum shifts. John Bell Hood's hard-fighting division counterattacks through the cornfield and drives back Hooker, though at a frightful loss. Hooker calls for support from Major General Joseph Mansfield's 12th Corps. I believe Mansfield's Mansfield advances his divisions in a formation that make them an easy target for Confederate artillery. And Mansfield is mortally wounded within minutes of entering the front lines. This is a big deal. It's not very often that Corps commanders are killed in battles. It really, I mean, you can not think of too many. Uh, you know, on the Union side, John Sedgwick uh, is a Corps commander that was killed. Uh, Mansfield is one. It does not happen all that often. On the uh, Confederate side, you had Stonewall Jackson. Uh, Leonidas Polk is another example. But very, very few times do you have Corps commanders killed in battle. There's a lot of heroics that happen on both sides during this uh, fight for the cornfield as well. There's a young kid. I mean, he's like a teenager. I, I want to say 14 or so. He's a bugler uh, who starts helping fire one of the batteries and is given the Medal of Honor. I talked about him in my visit to the battlefield. Um, at one point, one of the Union generals gets down off of his horse. He's, I think, a division commander and starts helping one of the gun crews fire one of the guns. I mean, I'm sure it's happened other times, but it's one of the only times I could find where you have a general actually helping load and fire an artillery piece during a battle. Yet one division of the 12th Corps manages to break through the Confederate line and reaches the Dunker Church. Before he can follow up on this initial success, General Hooker gets shot in the foot and leaves the fight. Lacking a leader to unite the 1st and 12th Corps, there is no rapid follow through on the Union success at Dunker Church. So now you have both Corps commanders here, the 1st Corps and the 12th Corps commanders out of action, one mortally wounded, one wounded in the foot. Uh, command and control becomes an issue, but now you're gonna have Sumner come down with the 2nd Corps. With little sense of the rebel positions, around 9 a.m., General Edwin Sumner leads his 2nd Corps into the fight. And to give you a sense, too, of how, how this is all going, these three corps right here outnumber the entire Confederate Army. I mean, there's that many men here in each one of these Union Corps. Just they themselves 
outnumber the entire Confederate army. So Jackson's probably holding out against two to one numbers right now. And so it was fierce, fierce fighting. Rebel positions. Around 9 a.m., General Edwin Sumner leads his second corps into the fight. Though his corps, three divisions strong, is nearly half the size of Lee's entire army, Sumner's columns are strung out and he attacks with but one division. Cedric. Sumner intends to turn the Confederate left flank, but it's his own that's vulnerable. Sumner's largest division, that of John Sedgwick, moves into the West Woods and is overwhelmed by a powerful Confederate counterattack. You, you can see how these Union attacks were not well coordinated. Uh, imagine if all three, the 1st, the 12th, the 2nd, had all attacked at one time with their overwhelming numbers. I think they probably would have pushed through because at one point they almost broke through the lines anyway. Uh, but then by this point, you know, and imagine these guys are marching over fields where thousands of men have already fallen. I mean, this cornfield just had to have been an absolute blood bl bloodbath at this point. Sedgwick falls back with barely half of his men. Lee's left flank had been battered and bruised, but not broken. Although occasional fighting still occurs in the vicinity, by mid-morning, the battle shifts for the south toward an old sunken farm road. So this would be the Confederate center now at the sunken road. Of the 10 regiments of William French's division of Sumner's 2nd Corps, only three had ever been in a battle. Awaiting them are two of D.H. Hill's brigades, Rhodes Alabamians and Anderson's North Carolinians, men that had seen plenty of combat. They had taken control of an old wagon shortcut, a portion of it sunken. So you've got combat veterans who have been in battle many times before in this sunken road. So they're down below. They've got a natural fortification. They're on the defensive and men are marching across an open field toward this, men who have never been in combat before. It's a recipe for disaster, but they keep on coming, and to the Union credit, uh, they fight hard, and they do eventually uh, kind of win the day in that area, only because the Confederates run out of ammunition. By frequent use. John Gordon's here too, one of the Confederates' best commanders. Hill's veterans inflict 1,700 casualties on French's division. At 10.30, reinforcements pour in on both sides. Lee commits the last of his reserves in the vicinity to extend Hill's right, while Richardson's division arrives to reinforce French. An Alabama officer ordered to realign his regiment mistakenly shouts about face amid the battle's roar. All along the sunken road, it looks as if a general retreat has been ordered. Five regiments of Confederates begin to fall back towards Sharpsburg. Lee's center is now in grave danger of collapse. Richardson's advance is blunted by artillery from General James Longstreet at Piper Farm and further assaulted by small but ferocious counterattacks organized by D.H. Hill. Once again, Lee adeptly moves smaller units to stop McClellan's large blue tide. General Richardson is fatally wounded, and without his initiative, the Union advance grinds to yet another halt. So think about this. They've lost Hooker. They've lost Mansfield. Now they lose Israel Richardson. Uh, it's been devastating on the Union right as far as command and control go. Though 12,000 fresh men of the 6th Corps have just arrived at the front, General McClellan uses him to bolster his shattered right flank, and at the sunken road misses an opportunity to crack Lee's line. Could have finished him. And everything that happens on the right, what happens in a lot of these battles, and I don't know if it's intentional or not intentional in this case, but a lot of these battles where we think of really disastrous attacks, places like Marie's Heights at Fredericksburg, uh, you have to remember they weren't necessarily meant to be the main attacks. 
uh, you know, they understood, the Union fully understood that Marie's Heights, that attack was going to be a bloodbath and that it was a brutal place to attack. But the whole point at Fredericksburg was that Marie's Heights was supposed to be the diversion while the Union left broke Stonewall Jackson and pushed around. Uh, and so in this case, the stuff that happens down at Burnside Bridge later in the battle on the Union left uh, would have com been a completely different story if Stonewall Jackson had been routed on the Union right, as should have been the case with four Union Corps over there. By 1.30, when the fighting ebbs here, 5,600 men lay dead or wounded in an area that becomes known as the Bloody Lane. Antietam's battle toll is 17,500 and climbing. So this is 17,500 just on that half of the battlefield. That's the majority of the casualties that take place during the battle. Uh, almost all of the casualties take place in the cornfield in the Bloody Lane. And if you go there today, it's not a big area. It's not like Gettysburg, which is a big, wide, sprawling battlefield. Fredericksburg's a huge battlefield. Uh, Vicksburg is a big battlefield. Uh, you can stand at the Dunker Church and see the entire area where these 17,000 casualties take place from one end to the other. Lee's right flank is arguably his most critical. It's the closest to his escape route home. Yet by mid-morning, he has only 3,000 to defend it. Across the creek, Ambrose Burnside's 9th Corps waits. He has been told to launch a diversionary attack Diversion. on the Confederate right to draw... See, this was never meant to be the main attack. Uh, it was only meant to keep them busy and keep him from reinforcing the other side where the main attack was coming from. It's just the main attack didn't succeed. So this turns into this kind of bloody assault that just goes on and on and on all day. Oh, attention away from Hooker's assault. But Burnside has been commanded to hold until given explicit orders to attack. Orders that do not reach him until 10 a.m. This two-hour delay gives Lee time to shift crucial artillery to his right flank. Burnside opts to divide his force. He sends one division under Isaac Rodman three quarters of a mile downstream to cross at Snaverly's Ford. Which is a good idea. His other divisions will be funneled across a 12-foot wide bridge. And that's important. When you go there, you understand. This is why it's so important to visit these battlefields. Your understanding of battles completely changes when you see the locations. When you go there to Burnside Bridge and you see this 12-foot wide bridge, which you can barely drive a car across, that's how narrow it is. And then you see that as soon as you get across the bridge, it is straight up for about, I don't know, 60, 70 feet. You understand how a few hundred men could hold off thousands and thousands of Union soldiers very, very easily. And actually, later in the battle, uh, there's actually a monument right up on top of that hill overlooking Burnside Bridge to the 23rd Ohio, which is really cool because the 23rd Ohio is the only regiment, I think, in American history that can boast that it had two U.S. presidents in it at the same time, two future U.S. presidents. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, who I believe was a lieutenant colonel, had been wounded at one of the earlier battles in the Antietam campaign, so I think he was not at Antietam. Uh, but he was the like the lieutenant colonel, I think, of the 23rd Ohio. And at the time, one of their commissary sergeants uh, was young William McKinley, who would eventually become a brevet major. Um, but he was so he was at the battle, and I think they actually built the monument to William McKinley after his assassination in 1901. 100 feet above it stand 400 Georgians, backed by 12 cannon. Burnside's men will cross the bridge at point-blank range. Crook's Union Brigade leads the first charge, but emerges 350 yards upstream and never makes the assault. At 11 a.m., Noggle's Brigade tries again, but is blasted into retreat before even reaching the bridge. At 1 p.m., another charge is made, this time by Ferrero's twin 51st. 
they win the bridge at last. Around this same time, Rodman's division gets across Antietam Creek. Fearing they are about to be flanked, the Georgians finally fall back. And for the third time today, Lee's Army of Northern Virginia is on the verge of a resounding defeat. And then McClellan does McClellan things. I know, I, I bash McClellan like crazy on this channel. He deserves it. He should have destroyed Lee at this battle. He sh well, he should have taken Richmond in the, in the summer of 1862 uh, when he was on the doorstep of the city then and he overwhelmingly had the numbers. But here, this was by far the best chance, I think, until the end of the war that the Union had to really just destroy Lee's army. And they didn't do it. Lee is low on reserve troops, and Union artillery has begun to bombard the escape route through Sharpsburg. But Lee is once more spared by circumstance. Burnside takes two hours to get his 10,000 through the bottleneck at the bridge over Antietam Creek. He finally begins his march toward Lee's right flank at three, leaving two full brigades in reserve he intends to cut off Lee's retreat. His one mile wide attack is initially successful with one division pushing toward the Harpers Ferry Road while elements of two other brigades come to blows with D.R. Jones Confederates. Only Robert Toombs 700 man brigade is left to defend Lee's right flank. Many Confederates panic and run wild through the streets of Sharpsburg. But at 4 p.m., A.P. Hill's Light Division arrives after a forced march from Harper's Ferry. Despite their 17-mile march that day, Hill's exhausted men immediately strike Burnside's exposed left flank. There's just not enough men on the side for the Of evening. new and inexperienced recruits, these green troops stand in high corn and barely see what hits them. A.P. Hill's timely arrival saves Lee's army. See, the, the, what the Confederates have going for them is much the same as what the Union has going for them at the Battle of Gettysburg. It's, they're on the defensive, they're kind of bent around like this, so they've got tight interior lines uh, with the town of Sharpsburg right there in the center, so it's real easy for Lee to send his reserves and reinforcements where they're needed without having to go real far distance like the Union has to because they're wrapped around uh, at the greater distance. It's the exact opposite of what happens a year later at Gettysburg, but still the Union had the numbers and they, they could have easily, um, you know, I, I don't fully understand why McClellan didn't especially when they're engaged and once they've pushed across Burnside Bridge on the left flank, why they didn't re-engage with their fresh troops on the Union right and push there. But there were a lot of troops that were never even used during the battle on the Union side. 12 hours of savage bloodshed has withered Lee's army to 30,000. Though the fighting has ended, he remains on the field till the next day, ready for battle. Lee's got 30,000 men left. He's lost 10,000. He's lost a quarter of his men. The Union's lost similar casualties, about 12,000, but that's a much smaller percentage of their army. So now McClellan's got about a 70,000 to 30,000 advantage on the field. Many, and all of Lee's men, for the most part, pretty much all of them have fought. McClellan's still got a fair number of fresh troops that he could have committed. McClellan considers an attack, but once again, pauses and allows Lee to slip back into Virginia to fight again. So who won the battle at Antietam? McClellan's army controlled the field and arguably saved the nation by driving Lee from the U.S. Capitol's doorstep. It's a strategic victory for the Union because Lee retreats back across the Potomac more importantly, it gives Lincoln his excuse to um, spin it as a victory so he can issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which changes the nature 
uh, and the goal, the aims of the war, and probably removes any threat of Europe intervening on the side of the Confederates. And so, for those reasons, Antietam's pretty significant. It's still an incredible missed opportunity. But many believe he missed a true opportunity to inflict a fatal blow on the Army of Northern Virginia. For failing to actively pursue Lee, President Lincoln permanently relieves McClellan of his command two months later. And you might ask, why? Why did he wait two months? Why didn't he remove him in September? Why does he wait until the end of the first week of November? Because of the elections. They have congressional elections in the fall of 1862. If Lincoln loses, if the, if the Republican Party loses control of Congress, then he loses the ability to prosecute the war because Congress will basically cut off the funding. They'll cut off any ability to keep the war going and he'll have to sue for peace. So he's got to keep the House, especially. And so he waits until those elections are over because McClellan is a war Democrat. In fact, he's the Democratic nominee for president two years later in 1864. And so Lincoln has to wait. But the, the moment he finds out that the Republicans, though they take some losses, they do hold on to Congress. He gives the order to relieve McClellan of command and give Burnside the army. In one day, more than 3,600 men were killed. 19,000 were wounded and captured. More American dead than Pearl Harbor, D-Day, or 9-11. And many more would die after. Shocking portraits taken by Alexander Gardner are displayed in the North, exposing the grim realities of the war to all who see them. President Lincoln uses the victory to announce the Emancipation Proclamation, turning the conflict into a war destined to change the very nature of American society. By freeing the slaves, Lincoln also signaled the intent to use African Americans as soldiers. Which was huge, huge, Before for a number of reasons. It's huge, number one, because of the manpower. There were a couple of hundred thousand African American soldiers who fought, and, and they proportionally took higher casualties than any state, any single state's white troops did. Uh, heavy, heavy casualties. Uh, but they fought, and, and many people rightly said, once you put a uniform on a, on a black man and you give him the ability to fight for his own freedom, you can't possibly return these people to slavery after that. Uh, so this was a momentous time in American history when uh, these men were given the opportunity to fight, and they fought really, really well. And that was all possible because of Antietam. For the end of the war, almost 180,000 would serve their country. September 17th, 1862 remains the bloodiest single day in American history. So, like I said, um, if you believe in the cause of an organization like the American Battlefield Trust, uh, please consider, like I am, uh, becoming a member by donating to the organization. They, it's cool. Every couple of weeks, I get stuff in the mail from them, which usually inc includes a map of one of the uh, battles that they are working on preserving and, and updates on what they're doing and opportunities to uh, match donations from wealthy people and things like that. It's a very worthwhile organization. I uh, highly recommend if you have the opportunity and the means that you would donate to them. They preserve these battlefields and then they do everything they can to educate people about what happened there. And, and, and what I do is only possible because of people like that. So, um, Thanks for watching, and uh, we will see you again real soon. I am off to Sabaton concert tonight. See you later.